We're here to answer your gaming and game night questions, working with you to make your game nights better. Tonight's question comes from Tabletop Bellhop Patreon patron Jeff Seuss, who asks, what games do you keep on your shelves because they're easy to get people to play and easy to teach, even though you don't really like them that much yourself? Well, thanks for the question, Jeff. Uh, this is an interesting one that immediately had me wondering how big of a problem, well, problem's not the right word, how, how big of a thing is this? How many people actually keep games for other people to play? Like, is it common for people to keep games they don't love just because they know other people will play them? Like, I do this, obviously, and Jeff knows that, and I know Jeff does this, um, trying to collect um, more classic games. He, he's into to keeping the, the, the cornerstones of the hobby and, and the groundbreaking games so that people can experience them. So thus the question from Jeff, and it makes sense for the two of us, and I'm sure we could sit down in a coffee shop and go on for hours, but I do wonder how many other people do this. How many other gamers collect games for the sake of other people? Now, I, I have to admit, it's not something I'm personally likely to do. But even as I was writing that, I realized to some degree, I do and, and have because of my kids. Uh, yeah. There are games that they enjoy that I'm not in love with, but because they might like playing them, they get kept. They get kept around. Thankfully, Harry Potter clues not one of those. Yes, thankfully. Yeah, I'm wondering, but like I, I know my like I'm I'm trying to think of other game groups, and I know, and and everyone I can think of has at least a few of these. Now, again, Ian I know has a bunch, but again, he hosts public events, so it makes sense. Like for me, it makes sense for the same reason, right? Because I don't just buy and play games for myself or a personal group of friends and gamers. I don't game with the same people, say every Wednesday night that I have. For years now, ever since 2002, I've been more of a gaming ambassador and as much about spreading the hobby to new people as I am about trying new things myself. So I'm still all about trying new things <laughs> myself. That's the rest of the game collection. Right. Like I've honestly been running events here in Windsor for over 20 years now, which just sounds wrong to say, but I did the math and I'm like, wow, it has now been over 20 years since I've been hosting events here in Windsor. And because of this, over those years, a significant portion of my collection is based around running public play events and bringing games that I think uh, non-gamers will enjoy, games that are, are old classics, games that, that are just, just tried and true and everyone likes them, games people have asked for, and so on. And yeah, this includes some games I don't love. Yeah, for you, iconic games might be a requirement. Uh, if you don't love a game, but it's one that everyone knows about and wants to try... That may be more important than trying to shove a better game down their throats and pushing them away from the hobby. We aren't gatekeepers after all. Yes, and that is definitely a problem I've seen with some hobby gamers that are like, oh, you, 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 you can't play Catan, it's terrible. You need to play this instead, it's better. And um, listen to episode, I think it was 199.5, where we talked about why the hate on Catan we kind of get into that particular problem. But yeah, don't be a gatekeeper, right? That's that's one of the reasons. If, if all my games were heavy Euros and I invite my friends over and like, no, this is what I have, you're stuck playing them, that could be a problem as well. I've noticed the chat room's already kind of blowing out with a bunch of them here, which is pretty cool. Um, like Red Meeple Ryan has Catan and Pandemic because they can teach it. Um, Roger Dodger is noting that he reluctantly keeps Suro, Legendary Forest, Machi Koro, all again for new players. Uh, Danielle is mentioning Sword and Skull. That's another one. So we're definitely not the only ones, at least for the people who listen to our show. So far, I think that's everyone in the chat um, <laughs> who's spoken up. Uh, no offense to you lurkers. You're welcome to keep lurking or tell us games you own. I, like Deanna has a bunch, but by default. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think that's part of it. Now, what I will say, though, before we get into mentioning specific games is I both in an effort to not be too negative, but also because it's true. The games I'm going to mention tonight may not be my favorite games, but I do like them. And they are games that I am always willing to play or at least teach and, and watch and, you know, mediate. There is nothing in my collection or on the list tonight that I don't like. These games just may not be my first choice or even my 50th choice on a given game night when I'm sitting down to play with my friends on a regular game night. I can't say that's quite the same for me. If some of these games were in my collection, they wouldn't uh, 
wouldn't even be my 50th or at all on my list. <laughs> but we're there not, go. however, going to support actively negative games, games yeah. that are objectively bad or hurtful to someone or some group of people. Again, we're looking for people to join and enjoy the hobby. Yes. Yeah, because there are definitely games out there that people have asked me to bring to public play events or expect to see at our events that you won't see me bring ever. This includes the obvious ones like Cards Against Humanity and other games meant to offend, as well as most social deduction games. Now, there's nothing wrong with social deduction games. I just really don't like them myself. Well, it probably makes sense to have a copy of something like Werewolf at pretty much any public play event. It's just not my kind of game. So those are the ones I'm going to leave for someone else to bring and teach if they're so inclined. Those are the ones that even wouldn't even be on my list after a thousand other games. I don't like the ones on this list that Sean wouldn't be into. Luckily, we do have a variety of people. So, for instance, Werewolf and Catan do show up at our recent events brought by others. And I do have to thank everyone who brings out games to any of our events and lets me leave my copy of Catan at home <laughs> so that I can fill my bag with newer, cooler stuff. No, nothing against Catan. Now, in addition to this list being games I own for other people to play, I also was thinking about this, and I'm like, we could have rebranded this list as a number of different things, because really, this is going to end up being a, a good list of games to have at any public play game night, or a list of games every game group should own a copy of. But now, again, if your game group is public, like if you only have five friends and you don't like Catan, don't buy a copy <laughs> of Catan just to have it. That would be silly. But if you run your events in the public and you have a, a, a meetup or whatever you want to call it, some kind of guild or whatever you get together, these are games that are like kind of like a good starter basis to have to start up a gaming club or something like that. Which if you want to know how to start a gaming club, we've got an episode about that, but I didn't look up the number ahead <laughs> of time. We'll throw a link to that in the show notes. Uh, similarly, we've got ones about hosting public play events. And again, these games are perfect for that. Now, as yes. usual... This list is in no particular order. Mo literally typed them in in the order that they came into his brain, and they yep. are still in that list. Yep, that is exactly how it happens. That's how it happens most weeks. Okay. All right, number one, we mentioned it a couple times tonight, so we're going to jump right to Catan. I used to love Catan. I still respect Catan. And huge props to Claus Tuber, the designer who passed away just earlier this week, and whose shoulders we all walk on now. We wouldn't, this hobby wouldn't exist without the early work and, and continuing support Klaus gave to the, the hobby itself. Catan revolutionized and modernized board gaming. But not only that, putting that aside, it's, it's historical pedigree. It's still a very solid game to this day. It is one of the better role for resources games. It's one of the, the few open trading games that allows trading with all players an unlimited amount. The only problem I have is I just played it so much, ranging from casual games half in the bag because we have a keg in the other room to playing in tournaments. I've personally had enough Catan. I generally won't bring it out on its own, but I fully understand that it has lots of fans and to this day is still a great welcoming game for the more modern board game hobby. Yeah, I've recently made my feelings about this game known. Not interested in playing it at all, but at the same time, it is a widely known game. It's a game non-gamers will often have heard of and can be very welcoming to them for that reason. If they see something that they recognize, oh, I've heard of Catan, maybe I could try that if everyone else I know has heard of it. That's a great way to get them hooked. Yeah, and, and Catan pretty much is in the public eye now, the zeitgeist. It's been on enough different popular TV shows and sitcoms that pretty much is everyone's at least heard of it. And true enough, I'll bring it out to events. We're like, oh, Catan, I've heard of that. How does that play? Second to me is Splendor. And similar to Catan, I played a lot of Splendor and kind of feel like I've currently seen all the game is to offer. And again, that's not to say it's not a good game and it doesn't have replay factor. It took a lot of plays to get here. The reason this belongs on the list, though, is it's even more approachable than Catan. It's, it's great for showing people that board games are so much more than just Clue and Monopoly. One of the big things here that shocks people who don't, excuse me, shocks people who don't know modern board gaming is there's no dice. That blows some people's minds. Catan at least feels familiar because you start your turn by rolling the dice. Playing a board game where you don't roll your dice at the beginning of your turn, boom, I have seen people's minds explode. 
Splendor is also fantastic for introducing the concept of engine building, something you don't tend to find in mass market games where you're slowly building up an engine to be able to do more every turn and score more points in the end. For that reason, I keep Splendor. Now, I still haven't burnt out on this one personally, and I really should actually pick up a copy to play with my kids, as I think they would probably enjoy it. And one of the great things about it is that it's so easy to set up and get going mm -hmm. rather than many other games that they enjoy. And again, this also makes it fantastic at public play events because there isn't a long teach or a long setup where people are sitting around and getting distracted. You know, it's, it's really quick to get on that table and get playing. Now, there is a superhero version out there, and I know how much you love superheroes, so maybe you need to get the Infinity Gauntlet version where your gems are the Infinity Stones. Mm, possibly. Next up uh, is Dominion. And in this one, I can't really explain why I don't like it, because I don't get it. I, I'm not sure why. It just it never really clicked with me, which is odd, because I now love deck building as a mechanic. I like many deck builders that came after Dominion. But for some reason, when this game blew up locally, which was pretty much right when it came out, everyone was playing this. Everyone was loving it. And if it wasn't at an event, there were some specific players who always brought it. If they didn't show up, there was always some, oh, where's Dominion? Oh, you didn't bring Dominion this week? And I'm like, oh, sorry, that was Charles' copy. And Charles isn't here this week. To the fact that enough people asked for it, I went and bought a copy of Dominion and one of the expansions. But not both, because I didn't need both of it. I, I don't know what it was about this game. This this is one that just never clicked for me. And I am certain of all the games I own, this is probably the game that has been played most by people other than me. Like my copy of Dominion has probably been played by me three or four times. And I think Sean's been in two of those games. <laughs> this was the game I brought out and let other people go wild with. I, I even though it's not my favorite, I do have to applaud it for being basically for putting deck building on the map. Um, yes, I own StarCraft, the game that did deck building first. It doesn't wasn't the main feature though. This was this was the one that that got everyone talking about deck building and the one that everyone copycatted and developed into what we know as deck building today. I do have to applaud it for that. Plus, I will still say this is the most pure deck builder out there for introducing the concept. And it's easier to teach this than any other deck builder I've ever played. So Fair enough. Now, as I played so many deck builders before I ever got to play Dominion, it hasn't lost its luster for me yet. But I also know that it won't take that long to learn the puzzle and be, you know, over it. Uh, still, it's another welcoming game that people may have heard about or maybe a good game to help with if players are familiar with other deck builders the way I was. Following on from Dominion, I have another deck builder that I now only keep for when people request it, and that is Ascension. I loved Ascension when it came out, especially with the first few expansions, especially the one that added events. That, to me, was where it finally hit its stride. This was the deck building game that did win me over. This is where I'm like, yeah, Dominion was okay. It was interesting. Everyone loves it. Once I play this, I'm like, okay, now I know I love deck building. I like this mechanic. It, it, it swung me over to the other side. It had me sold on this new thing. Um, two things, though, have pushed me away from the game. Now, the first is the flood of content, the amount that was put out and the way they released the expansions. And I say I love this set with the the events in it. The problem is when the next set came out, it didn't have events. And if you combine the decks, the events became too few and far between. And then the next set didn't have events. So now the odds of drawing an event were silly and they just stayed up the whole game like they, they weren't designed to work with each other. But then who is going to buy Ascension and only use two of the sets together? Like, it just didn't make sense. Sorry, I said Dominion. I mean Ascension. Who's going to buy Ascension and just use these two sets, even though you own seven? So that is one of the reasons I, I kind of moved away from it. But the other one is the app. The app is still one of the best digital adaptations of a board game ever. And I still play it now and then. It's on my latest phone. And now and then when I'm sitting in a doctor's office or waiting in the car for someone, I'll pop it on and still play it. Now I keep Ascension for showing it off to fans of Dominion or people who are like, oh, I've heard of deck building, but but let me know it. So, like, honestly, this is my next step game. If I hear someone say, oh, I like deck builders, I'll be like, oh, have you tried Ascension? If not, then I'll bring it out to the next event. And the other nice part about this one compared to some others is that it is a multiplayer deck building game, which is a little more rare than you would think at times. To me, this is a fantastic next step. Like. 
Plus, if someone's more of a fantasy and they're into theme, because that is the one thing that is definitely a little lacking in Dominion, um, going back to last week's topic. Well, I think theme is definitely part of it. And I know someone in the chat room called out uh, theme as being one reason you might not have liked Dominion. Uh, I think the other re is the uh, it's not a static marketplace, which brings a little yes. more dynamic to the mm -hmm. game and makes it a little bit more interesting. Uh, this one, though, I don't know if I agree with you because I have never even considered buying this game. Uh, I can't even imagine owning a physical copy of Ascension because there's the app. The app is amazing, and it means I can play without having to figure out how to shuffle a thousand cards together in these unmanageable stacks. While I respect its place in history, owning it, I would immediately sell it so I could buy the next digital expansion. Oh, fair <laughs> enough. I will point out that we have played the digital version at public play tabletop <laughs> events, so... It's definitely happened. I, I forget where we were playing some game where the turns took so long that I started up a game of Ascension while we were playing. Yep. All right, next up, the chat's already kind of talking about this one for, for good reason. And I'm going to stick with deck builders. And this was just a logical progression. After I got a bit tired of Ascension, I then got hooked on Star Realms. I got to thank Wayne the Starfleet. Starfleet guy? Wow. I that. He's going to punch wow. me if he's <laughs> Wayne the Star Wars guy. I hope he's not a uh, Wayne Humphrey. Wayne Star Wars Humphrey for introducing me to Star Realms at Origins, which I then immediately bought a, I think, two decks at the time. I, I played a lot of Star Realms, uh, perhaps more than any other game in my collection. Again, if you count digital plays, I had played a lot of Digital Ascension until I got Star Realms. I loved the new combo system this game introduced. To me, that was the biggest, besides a non-static market, it was the biggest evolution in, in deck building and one we still see to this day. Um, we, the uh, Cowboy Bebop Space Serenade is, is one we played recently. They use a very similar system. I love that new combo system, and that had me hooked. But it had the Catan Splendor problem for me. I just played it too much. Plus, yes, I know in the rowboat there's ways to play up to six, but really this is a two-player only game, and there are other two-player games I prefer. Now that said, it's small, it's one deck, great to have at a public play event, but when you have that one player who shows up late or has trouble getting into a game, and the host can sit down with them and play a game of Star Realms with them to keep them occupied. And it's also great as a, the same reason as Ascension, as a next step deck build. Like, I have actually seen public play events of this. Um, like, I own three decks of the base game where I brought all three out and had six people playing Star Realms, but not together. They were just in three separate games. Yeah, because it's far more manageable than Ascension, I think it really is a great next step. Uh, it's great for introducing new engine and combo ideas that people may not be familiar with from more basic deck builders. Uh, it's not a go-to game for me either anymore, but it's definitely worth keeping around. Yep. Moving away from deck builders, but sticking with a card game is Hanabi. Now this is another one I bought for the same reason I bought um, one of with the other games I mentioned, sorry, uh, Dominion, which is it got requested so often at public play events that I wanted to make sure it was on hand. There was one local gamer who picked it up, but it was someone who couldn't make it out all the time. There were an infrequent guest at our events. And once they got a few players hooked, they're like, Oh, do you have it? Do you have it? Do you have it? So I went and picked up a copy. Now I do love the uniqueness. I, I love the concept of the co-op where you can't see your cards and you can only see your opponent's cards. There's just something about this game. I don't like, and I don't know if it's like my lawful good nature or something, but it's, I think it's the way everyone subtly breaks the rules when they play and how each group comes up with their own language when playing. Now, I fully get this makes the game more winnable and therefore more enjoyable to some people. It just always felt off to me. Like, I'm going to hold the card this way, and if my pinky's over here, that means this. And if I say the words like, you have a two, means something different than you have a two. I it just, I don't know, it bugged me. Now, what I do enjoy, though, because of that, that evolving gameplay is watching people play Hanabi. I will happily show up, teach people play Hanabi, and sit back and watch. And kind of giggle at the ways they come up at how to cheat but i don't know i, I it's it's 
I, I love watching it. If if people, especially if you, you teach them and they play, like they've never played games together. They don't know each other. And then you watch like two or three games in a row because Hanabi is one of those games you usually play a few in a, in a row and see that evolve. That is always fascinating to me. But it's a popular game. I keep it in my collection for other people to play and sometimes to watch them. As someone who's only played it digitally without any way uh, to have communication <laughs> other than what is strictly allowed by the game, uh, I haven't experienced that house rules of cheating develop. Uh, I just love the thought process of trying to work out how to, you know, which of those communications to use, you know, who to, sp who to speak to, looking at the right. player order, the turn order, and trying to guess what the heck someone is going to think if you tell <laughs> them that they have a two. <laughs> yeah. um, but I can see how this might wear thin physically for exactly the reasons that, that you've brought up. Still, it's a great game to drive home the limited communication ideas mm -hmm. on a path to other games that limit communication yeah oh i agree next the chat called this one knew it was going to be on our list somewhere and they're currently talking about the digital version and that is carcassonne uh, this game is a classic for a reason i still enjoy carcassonne i played a lot of carcassonne but somehow never really got all that sick of it I would happily wrap up our podcast night and go play a game, maybe with the digital version. The reason this makes the list, though, is that I don't actually ever play Carcassonne. There are other tile laying games I like more. Well, stopping tonight and going to play Carc sounds good. You know what sounds better? Going to play Isle of Sky or Land vs. Sea. Now, I don't have Xbox versions of those, so it might not be as easy to get them to the table, but I would rather play them. So in general, I keep my copy of Kark on hand because it often gets requested at public play events. It comes up now and then with long-term fans like, oh, we haven't played Kark in a long time. I'd like to play Kark and you bring it next time. Um, and again, it's there's a reason this game has the staying power it does. It's as old as Catan. I think it might even be a bit older and it's still people request it, still play it. This is a great welcoming game and it's also very family friendly. Little kids can match up the sides of the tiles, even if they don't quite get the farm scoring. Yeah, another classic for some, although perhaps less awareness outside of the hobby, uh, unlike Catan or Settlers, which have gotten mm. a lot of, you know, big media attention. Yes. Um, it's still to this day a solid game with some great design. And unless you've gone wild and bought every single expansion, it can be a very welcoming game for newcomers. I will admit, this is one of the few games I actually own two copies of. One is just the base game, and the other is my Kark with all of the expansions tossed in together. So I actually have two copies of them. It's because another gamer I knew locally was getting out of games and gave me a copy. But I'm like, I kept both because now I have Kark for beginners and Kark with the rules I like. And uh, I, there are some of those expansions I prefer. And D points out uh, Kark was from 2000, so it's actually five years younger than five years. Uh, Catan younger than Catan. Okay, I couldn't remember the order. For a while there, if you Googled or asked anyone, what, what are the best hobby board games? You always got Kart, Catan, and Ticket to Ride. Or, or not Ticket to Ride, sorry, Power Grid. Those were like the three that everyone mentions you had to try. And I don't know if that's still around. I, I, still, I still hear Catan, that's for sure. But now you hear Catan, Kart, and Ticket to Ride is what I hear more often. But I still hear Kart getting called out. All right, next I have Roll For It. I first tried this game at Origins doing it during a demo where someone who was obviously throwing the game, um, which I will admit probably colored my opinion of the game a bit and didn't think too much of it. But then I got a copy as a gift because it's one of those games where people don't be like, oh, you're a gamer. I found this cool dice game somewhere because you can find it at um, especially educational stores. So I got a copy as a gift and I gave the game another shot. And I found a very simple to teach, highly random game that was super approachable like this is to me almost like a racco level of game like i prefer more depth to my games in general but i learned this is a fantastic game for new gamers the basic concept is so simple roll your set of dice put the dice on cards if you fill a card you get to keep it for points you've got decisions like do you push your luck and go for a high scoring card but you need all sixes or do you grab a bunch of easy cards that let you keep your dice in play and keep you rolling I think it was playing this with my kids that really convinced me this is great for public play events, especially one that's in public as opposed to, say, a hobby game store or a comic book store. Like if you're in a coffee shop 
or you're at a, a pub, just the, the sound of the rolling dice, people tend to get excited. It's dice rolling. There's tension. You're like, yeah, I got my six sixes. It, it, it's a great for drawing in a crowd. So I have to admit, despite not enjoying it at first, I find Roll For It a great game for others to enjoy. I've never actually played this one, but dice placement is such a great man mechanic. So while I think I might tire of this one somewhat swiftly, it's a great bridge to introduce the mechanic so that it's familiar when you want to get someone interested in those more advanced dice placement games. Next, I have Suro. I think like most gamers out there, I was hooked on Suro for about a week. Maybe it lasted two. It looks great. The components are awesome. The gameplay is super simple. While the lure wore off quickly for me, I still see the appeal of this game as one of the best welcoming games out there, as well as being one of those unique, hey, look what board games can do that are different from what you grew up with. Now, the added bonuses here are the fact it plays up to eight players. This is fantastic for bigger events where you get large groups that want to play stuff together. Personally, I'm all about split up into groups of three and we'll all play different games, but I know there's those gamers out there like, let's all do something together. That's where games like Suro come in. The other thing I liked about this one is that it is a great filler between for between games because it's super short. Like 15 minutes might be a long game of Suro in some cases. What I used to like to do with this one is I would bring out my copy of Suro and put it at some type of standing table where people can stand around it, set it up, and whenever a table wrapped up, and they're kind of waiting for other games to end, I would bring those gamers over and quickly teach them the game. And then throughout the night, anyone who's just trying to kill some time could go over to the Suro table and get in a couple rounds of Suro. Now, I'm not sure if I should even say that I haven't played this one. <laughs> now, does that mean I have to lose my board gamer card? I don't know. I don't know. This is one of those ones that came out when you weren't down here board gaming with us. And while well, you missed that two week window where we're like, <laughs> yeah, you got to play Suro. So I'm starting to feel that we need another Sean Con here just to get you to try each of the games in this list you haven't played at least once. Though for the moment, we've got a lot of other games on our priority list. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Next up is Love Letter. I personally never really saw the broad appeal of this game, but I totally know it's a thing. This 18-card game is a huge hit and spawned possibly more knockoffs than most other hobby games. Like, not Monopoly, but... There's definitely, I think, more versions of Love Letter out there than there are Catan expansions. Due to the frequent requests of this game at our public play events, I eventually decided to pick up a copy. Knowing I was only going to get one copy of Love Letter, I did my research and I went with the one with the original Japanese artwork. That would appeal to me the most. It looked the coolest. Now, I keep that copy on hand for when people want to play, but it, at this point, it's been so long since I personally played, I've actually forgotten how to play Love Letter. I know it's something about look at a card, play a card, and then you're trying to have the highest or lowest numbered card and you get to collect tokens. I don't know. The nice part about this, why this isn't so bad, is every time someone has requested to play my copy of Love Letter, they already knew how to play and they're willing to teach it. So I just kind of sit back, I provide the game, and I go, you guys go have fun over it. Yeah, no clue about this game, actually. I, I always hear about it. Uh, I seem to always confuse it with For the Queen, uh, it turns <laughs> out, uh, which I also haven't played yet. But I do have a digital edition, so I should really try this out sometime. For all I know, maybe I'll love it and I'll start teaching it at Blood Blood Play events. There you go. <laughs> it's definitely a popular one, especially with all the variants. Uh, my personal favorite is one called Luche Jefe, which is a, a, a Mexican luchador wrestler game where you're actually playing two cards and one's, one's who's in your corner. And of course, you have all the manipulation of cards and whoever wins gets a little actual paper belt you can put on your fingers. <laughs> That, that that's that's my favorite love letter clone but that one's a bit much for non gamers so like well wait what's going on you kind of have to <laughs> have to know a bit more next another one that i fell in love with played a ton and then played too much of and got sick of and that is pandemic i man when we first got this we were going bonkers over this game like i we might have played 20 or 30 times in one weekend when we got this one i was absolutely hooked the problem I did find, though, is with that group, it was fantastic. Then the first time I brought it out to a public play event, it went terrible. This game can be very group dependent, mainly based on how pushy some players are. Quarterbacking is a huge issue in this game. 
Then, of course, there's the fact that now I have absolutely zero interest in playing any game about the topic of a global pandemic for obvious reasons, and I may never want to play a game with that theme again. Now, despite current events, I know the game does have a ton of fans. It is pretty easy to teach, and as long as you watch the quarterbacking from experienced players, this can be a good welcoming game. Just watch for that one player who thinks they know the game better from, than everyone else. Yeah, I played this game once. It did nothing much for me, and I've just never especially craved playing it again. It, it wasn't a bad game. It just wasn't great. It is another welcoming game that has a huge awareness in the public, if mm -hmm. not always for the best reasons. <laughs> Next, we have Rumble in the Dungeon. So I've noticed this list tends to have like two, a scale of I played it too much or it's a little too easy. And that's what this one is. It's on the too easy side for me. This is a case of a super simple, silly game. It's great for the right time and place, but not something I'm going to recommend often to play at home. But it is a great icebreaker, filler, or end of game night public play game. It also has the bonus of the high player count. I think this one goes up to 10 players, which again is good for those groups who are like, well, we got to play something all together. And this is completely, totally 100% family friendly. So there's benefits there. Now, I also have to admit, I do keep this one for the kids because they love this game, even though they're now in their teens. Yeah, this is, uh, this is another one I've enjoyed. Uh, but don't really have the meat I'm interested in. Uh, while I wouldn't keep it, uh, I do wish there'd been a copy available when that family had been looking for games at that last public event. I think they would have really enjoyed it. You have to remember to bring that one on the 15th. Next is Skull. This is one of the few bluffing, somewhat social deduction style games I do still have in my collection and that I keep. Now, this was a traditional biker game originally played with beer coasters. Skull has players trying to one-up each other by betting on how many coasters they can flip over before revealing a skull. Now, despite its origins and roots in gambling, this actually has is a pretty solid family-friendly push-your-luck game with a bit of deduction and some really nice-looking coasters. Um, to be honest, my daughter, when we were bringing up the games for our backdrop today, was like, ooh, Skull, I like that one. So there's a good sign that my oldest daughter had a positive experience with this one. Now, this is simple to teach. One of the cool things about it is it can play any number of players, literally any number, as long as you have enough sets. Um, it used to be you could buy Skull and you could buy Roses, and you could combine the two. But Roses seems to be out of print. You can still find Skull. Uh, technically, if you just collected sets of four beer coasters, three the same, one different, you could pull this off on your own. Simple to teach, plays any number of players. I, this is one I don't mind playing now and then. Now, I will say, despite the fact my daughter loves it and it's very family friendly, I find this one tends to get the most traction, though, at bar-based events with adult beverages. Something about that coaster theme and the skulls, just and then and the, and the one-upsmanship, I think, uh, gets that game flowing when there is alcohol involved. I mean, we've been talking about this game since very early episodes. It comes up yeah. regularly. Honestly, though, it's just not one I've even been interested in adding to the Sean Must playlist. It's one of those yeah. games that I'll probably get around to playing at some point. But uh, overall, it's not really a theme that uh, has attracted me and, and wouldn't be in my collection for that reason. And we have Roger in the chat. Love Skull goes great with beer. See, <laughs> that's that's pretty much it. That's one I don't know. That That's one I think that might win you over if we actually sat you down to play it. If we had enough people and people have to be into it, too. That's part of it. I, 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 what is the, my one hatred in skull is when someone shuffles their tiles instead of intentionally picking where to hide the skull. That, that just ruins it for me. I'm like, you made the game random. Don't make it random. <laughs> like, like, bluff. Pretend you're shuffling them maybe and bluff, but yeah. All right. Number 15. This is my last board game for the night and the one we'll probably get the most flack for. Mo at tabletopbellhop.com. Our chat room's already called it, though, because they are fans and know my opinion on this game. That is Ticket to Ride. You all know I've never been a big fan of this game, but I will play it fast. I don't hate it in any way. It's just, I don't know, not my favorite game. But the popularity of this game did have me seek out a copy for our public play events. 
And when I did so, I decided to go for the big anniversary edition. I figure if I'm going to own a copy that's specifically for public play, I might as well make it the edition that would catch the most attention and hopefully draw people in. Now, I will admit, since getting it, that is all we bought it for. My extended family and my kids actually have grown to enjoy the game. And it is one we tend to play a couple of years with the kid's grandmother and aunt. You just can't deny the popularity of Ticket to Ride and the notoriety of Ticket to Ride. I, I am clearly on the record as disliking Ticket to Ride. Uh, that's Sean at TabletopBellhop.com. Uh, I will actively say no to playing Ticket to Ride. But alas, everyone else seems to love it and be interested in it, so it certainly holds a place as a welcoming game for many. But there are quicker versions that you can get out there and get done faster. <laughs> yeah, this isn't this is a, maybe our next episode will be if next steps to play with people who always ask for these games. There you and go. we can come up with with a suggestion on that. So I noted this was my last board game on the list and that is I, I i keep for the sake of other gamers but since this question comes from local indie rpg guru jeff uh the hippie gamer that he is i wanted to toss in one more honorable mention that i am sure he will appreciate there is one rpg i keep copies of even though i haven't been a fan in years and that is dungeons and dragons again mo at tabletopbellhop.com while I don't in any way hate D&D and have had fun both running and playing it, it is not my system or setting of choice. The thing is, though, it's the system that everyone knows and the one you can usually get a group of four to six gamers to agree to playing together. Due to this, I have run way more Dungeons and Dragons than any other RPG, so it would never be my first choice of what to run. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I've got uh, actually a couple episodes. I had my my second ed uh, player's guide sitting up on my in my background, uh, but I no interest in in what they've done, where they're going, continuing on with it. There are so many role playing games out there, better suited to specific action and and, and genre that uh, there's just no need other than because other people want to play D&D to have a copy yeah. of D&D. The thing I do miss the most is the public play aspect. I, if they hadn't changed Adventurers League to running published adventures and stuck to the old format, I would probably still be running D&D. That is the one aspect of the game I loved, but that touched the gaming ambassador in me. That was me sharing the role-playing hobby, not necessarily enjoying D, D, but again i you know major kill in the chat just called out there are so many better rpgs but yes we all have player handbooks just in case you know it's interesting actually you mentioned that and were that going on now with me in windsor and my schedule being what it is i probably would go out on a thursday night to play yeah. adventure league um yeah. at your table or at another table just just to mix it up and 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 have fun uh it, it is a shame that the, that sort of group uh, regularity isn't there. Yeah, sad to see it go. Well, that's it for our list of games we've kept in the collection, mainly for other people's enjoyment and not our own. Do you have any games you keep because other people dig them? Tell us about them in the comments below. Now we're about to check in with the lobby, but before that, a quick reminder that we're here to answer your gaming and game night questions, just like Jeff's question tonight. Get questions to us by going to tabletopbellhop.com and clicking on Ask the Bellhop, sending an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com. No hate mail there. That one's just for questions. Or send me a message on social media where I can be found everywhere as tabletopbellhop, one word. 